I don't really have anything too paranormal, but here's an event that stayed with me. And when I say stayed, I mean it's burned in my memory. It's an encounter I had with an Ojibwe woman named Sarah. Let me give a little context first. 1989, Congress passes a law. The Smithsonian must return many of the items that it has on exhibit, human remains, and funeral objects. Anything considered sacred by a native tribe must be returned to that tribe. This starts a chain of reparation of sacred objects. Fast forward, 2017. I'm working as an intermediary between American museums and Native Americans. The typical meeting goes like this. A tribal representatives show up at a museum. I provide them with a list of items on display and in storage. The representative makes a claim on an item or two. I determine whether that claim is legit. Did the item serve a religious function at any point in time? If the claim is legit, I inform the museum. Then we send the items back with the tribal reps. Nothing too complicated, but it can get messy. Many natives insist that certain items are sacred, even when they hold no religious purpose. This muddies the legal waters. Case in point, Sarah, Ojibwe. I'm expecting her for a meeting one morning. I've been told that she's been traveling state to state, museum to museum, searching for a very specific object. Before she arrives, I leaf through my inventory sheets. I see that the museum does have a number of sacred Ojibwe items. This includes a ceremonial pipe and stem currently on display. A big no-no nowadays. Sarah shows up. Her request surprises me. She's looking for a cradle. I gently inform her that we don't repatriate utilitarian items. No moccasins, no baskets, no cradles. We can only return sacred items. Sarah tells me the cradle is sacred. It was carved by an elder for a spiritual purpose. Okay, but even if that's true, the museum is going to fight to keep the cradle. And they'll win, too. Cradles aren't used in religious ceremonies. Besides, there's not even a cradle listed in the inventory. But Sarah asks if she can look around anyway. I oblige. I lead her through the museum. We pass by the ceremonial pipe and stem on display. Sarah stops. She looks at it, then at me. Her face is filled with sadness. This is an Ojibwa pipe, she says. It's considered sacred and should not be on display. I tell her I'm aware of that. I've already filed the appropriate paperwork. She can leave with it today if she wishes. Sarah thanks me. I lead her towards the storage room. On the way, she tells me about the cradle. How an Ojibwa elder carved it over half a century ago. How he made it out of a sacred tree. When he found the tree, the elder thanked the spirits. After chopping it down, he left an offering. When he returned to his tribe, he fashioned a cradle out of the wood. Then, he presented it to Sarah's grandparents. It was a gift for Sarah's mother, only a newborn at the time. I had a dream about the child, the elder tells them. In the dream, the spirit spoke to the elder. They told him to make Sarah's mother a cradle out of this sacred tree. They told him to bless it with a powerful prayer. Then, they told him to deliver a message to the family. Your child... Sarah's mother will be a drum keeper, and her child, Sarah, will be a spiritual leader. Drum keepers are people who look after ceremonial drums, by the way. And her child, the elder says, will be a powerful medicine man. And even after I am gone, I will be with them, he says. Then, the elder prays. He prays over Sarah's grandparents, over Sarah's infant mother, and over the cradle. This is why it's considered sacred, Sarah told me. It belongs with my tribe. It belongs to my child. She places her hand on her stomach. I didn't even notice a baby bump. She must only be a few weeks pregnant. I'm not sure how to respond. Decide to just keep silent. We arrive at the storage room. I open the door, and Sarah steps inside. Then, she gasps. It's here, she says. I try to remind her that there is no cradle listed on the inventory sheet, but she's already hurrying through the aisles of boxes and shelves. She stops at a large box, labeled junk. She opens it. Inside, it's a beautiful, solid wood cradle. Sarah instantly falls to her knees. After a long silence, she begins to quietly sob. I feel incredibly awkward. I was never good around people who cry. I tell Sarah I'll give her some time to look through everything. Then I head back into the museum. And this is where things get a little strange for me. I'm making my way back towards the front desk. I pass the ceremonial pipe and stem display. 
The entire thing is encased in plexiglass, I believe. There's no way anybody could touch it, but the thing is taken apart. I don't mean knocked over, I mean actually taken apart. The stem is still held in place by the stand, but the pipe is removed. It's sitting in front of the stand. The only way to do this is by hand. The stand is a very snug fit. I talked to the guy at the front desk. To his knowledge, neither the curator nor the museum director haven't stopped by at all. There's nobody who could have altered the display. I actually go back and look at the pipe display for a while, trying to figure out what exactly happened. Then Sarah approaches. She's no longer crying. She looks excited. She tells me that she'll be back in one week to pick up the cradle. I remind her again that the cradle is not technically considered sacred. She says she knows, but she was told to be back in one week. Told? By whom? I ask. But she just tells me she'll be taking the pipe today. Long story short, she leaves with the pipe and stem. Over the next week, I review the museum footage. I'm interested in whether the pipe and stem display simply fell apart, even though it's unlikely. Due to the angle and lighting, I couldn't see much on the security footage, just the glare of the plexiglass. I did determine, though, that nobody ever approached a display during the time that Sarah and I looked at it, and when I returned to find the pipe, disassembled. Needless to say, I'm scratching my head. One week later, Sarah shows up again. By now, things have changed. The museum director is being forced to give up the cradle. The inventory mix-up kind of put him in hot water. There's a potential for a hefty fine. Possible legal repercussions, too. It's just a cradle, he tells me. Nothing worth seeing. Give it to her. Let's just get rid of it. He literally decides this an hour before Sarah shows up. This is highly unusual, even unethical by most standards. But inwardly, I'm kind of laughing to myself. Part of my job requires being sensitive to native customs and values. I'm thinking, this little lady actually got her cradle back. So when she arrives, I hand a cradle over to her. It's hard to impress upon people how unusual this is when I tell them about it. An Ojibwa woman with no education and without putting up a fight is managing to leave the museum with a non-sacred item. This literally never happens. Is it just luck? I can't help but ask her. You seemed so sure that you would be leaving with this item today. Why? This woman is soft-spoken and unassuming. Her response surprises me. You call these things items. You put them in glass cages. She shakes her head like she's enraged. But they suffer like we do. They have spirits just like the living. I'm too embarrassed to speak. Feels like when my mom used to lecture me as a kid. But then she touches her belly. Her next words are clear as day in my mind to this day. New life comes into the world, and elders die, she says. But the spirits stay with us. If you listen, you can hear them too. Then she walks out the door. I never see her again. Freshman year. New kid at my school. Crazy, short, and skinny. Mint green hair. Wears something like a spandex bodysuit under baggy sweaters every day. Literally eats nothing but a can of cat food and a bottle of Mountain Dew at lunch every day. Got caught peeing in the sink of the boys' bathroom and the girls' bathroom several times. Never found out if it was a boy or a girl. Actual story. For a while, there was a weeaboo girl that had a crush on it because she thought that its green hair was from an anime. It was actually really nice to her about it for the first week or so, but eventually, shit got really annoying. Have to leave class to get something from my locker. Locker is away from most of the school in the band wing. Hear crying. Follow sound into the theater area. Crying is coming from the girl's dressing room. No, I shouldn't go in because I'm not a girl. Don't want to just leave someone crying. What if they're hurt or something? Go in anyway. It's the weeaboo girl. She's hiding under the mirror table and sobbing hard. Ask her what happened. She shakes her head and keeps crying. Crouch down with her and try to pull her out. She grabs onto me. Seriously worried now. Tell her that she has to stop crying and tell me what happened. She's still crying, but trying to talk. She says, He licked me. Think she got molested or something. Ask her if she was assaulted. She shakes her head and starts trying to calm down. Your friend, he licked me. His face opened up and he, he grabbed me and wouldn't let go. And he made me open my mouth and he licked my throat inside. Wow, what? This shit is clearly out of my league. Tell her we need to go to the office. She starts freaking the fuck out again and says that we can't. She says, 
He's going to kill me if I ever tell. You can't tell anyone. Promise me you won't tell. Tell her that the adults can handle this much better than us. She'll be okay. She starts screaming that I have to promise. So, I do. I tell her we should go to the nurse at least to see if she's not hurt. She won't go. I ask her if she wants to ask the office if her mom can come pick her up. She says no. I ask her what she wants to do. She asks me to just stay under the table with her. I figure someone has to stay with her. So I do. She wants me to lock the door. May as well. We're in it now. Wind up skipping school the rest of the day. When school lets out, she still doesn't act like she's ready to go. She hasn't said a word since she stopped crying. I finally ask her if she's going to leave. She says she doesn't know. I tell her we're going to wind up missing our buses if we don't get up soon. She's still so scared she doesn't know what to do. I don't want to miss my bus. My parents are already going to be pissed at me for skipping class. Say, look, if you're scared that it's going to kill you, wouldn't it be safer to go outside where tons of people are? It's not going to kill you where everyone can see it happen. She starts fucking crying again. Tell her if she doesn't get up now, I'm going to go get one of the counselors. She grabs onto me and says that she'll go. Just please don't tell anyone. Promise I won't. She gets up, tries to pull her shirt over her pants as much as she can. Ask what she's doing. She won't say. Pull her hands away. Her pants and underwear fall down. They're completely shredded around the back. Looks like someone took a weed whacker to her ass. About to demand that she goes to the nurse's office. She says, I don't want to talk about it. I didn't get assaulted. Nothing happened. Tell her there's no way people won't notice and ask her what the fuck happened. She says, I know. I'll just steal some pants from here. She winds up taking a costume skirt. She throws away her bloody clothes. She says, Okay, when we leave, let's just act normal. Don't talk about it. Don't ask him about it. Just act like nothing happened, okay? Tell her, okay. She tells me to wait a few minutes to leave so it doesn't look like we're together. Okay. She leaves. I slowly make my way out to the band hall. It's empty, thankfully. There were never many band kids. Poke around for a bit to give us time in between. Suddenly, hear someone walking this way. Just stare down the hall like an idiot. It's it. It stares back at me. It starts walking toward me. It said... What are you doing down here? Uh. It tipped its head at a weird angle, squinted and said, You're not a band kid. I stand my ground and try to look tough. Neither are you. It stops, puts its head back down, opens its eyes again, looks me up and down a couple times. It said in a less accusatory voice, Hey, you know, the buses are already gone. You need a ride home? Tell it, no. It says, Are you sure? I have a car. It wouldn't be a problem. Say I already have a ride on the way. It says, Okay, well, want me to wait with you? I know a nice place to hang out. Tell it no. It stares for a second. It squints again and tips its head back up. You don't have a ride. You take the bus every day. No one knows you're still here. Fuck, shit, fuck. It grins. Yeah, just come with me for a minute. You can call your mom. I know a place that has good phone reception. Starting to panic. Tell it I can just go outside to get phone reception. The only way to get away from it is to go past it. There's nowhere to hide but the dressing rooms and the bathroom. No idea if I would be able to fight it, especially after seeing what it did to that weeb girl. While I'm trying to think, it asks me, what are you going to do, Anon? Uh, fuck it. Scream as loud as I can and charge it. Screaming must have startled it. Plow into it with my shoulder. It hits the ground. I trip and stagger, but run over it. Keep running. Run outside. Run all the way home. It was fucking scary. Easily the third scariest thing that has ever happened to me. Sophomore year. Joined a computer graphics and animation club. So did it. Club winds up devolving into a group of people who get together and play video games. And occasionally try to make something in Blender. Since everyone who didn't get along with each other left the club, everyone who was left became at least sort of friends. We eventually decide we should have a party. We're going to go to Matt's house, where we would have a full reign of the basement. Have pizza, play the vidya, have a good old time. The night of the party. Everyone has a good time. All is going well. Party starts winding down. People start getting tired around 1 in the morning. As I'm laying down, I see It talking to Trevor. They're laying together. That's possibly gay. Roll over and ignore them. Fall asleep. Wake up. Footsteps on the stairs. 
sit up and try to see in the dark. Shout, who's there? It responds, it's me, you douche. I had to go to the bathroom. Oh, apologize for waking several people up. Go back to sleep. Wake back up. It's lighter, but not daylight. Matt is shaking me. He's asking, where's Trevor? Dude, you literally just woke me up. How would I know that? He says, Trevor is gone. I thought he was pulling a prank or some shit, but he's not here. And I checked the bathroom upstairs and the bathroom down here. And the living room and the kitchen, and I can't find him. Wait, the bathroom down here? There's a bathroom down here? Slowly turn to look at it. It starts stretching and stirring like it was just waking up. Props itself up on one elbow and asks us, What's going on? Matt says, Trevor's missing. It says, Are you sure he didn't go home? Matt says, All his shit is still here, even his laptop. It says, He's probably just pulling a prank on us. He probably wants us to go looking for him in the woods so he can jump out and scare the crap out of someone. Matt says, You seriously think anyone would go out into the woods in the dark to pull a shitty prank? It says, I would. It lays back down and closes its eyes. I have a really, really bad feeling. I grab Matt's arm and try to tell him with eyes. Trust me. He gets it. He follows me upstairs. Close basement door behind us. Watch the door. Back up from it. Back all the way up to the wall across from it. Keep watching it. Pull Matt over to me. Whisper in his ear. We need to find Trevor. It was up while we were all asleep. It did something to him in the woods. Matt looks really scared. He whispers back. We can't go out there. If it did something to him out there, what if it does something to us? It's dark. We won't even be able to see. I whisper. He's hurt. I think it may have hurt him really bad. You remember that frat girl that dropped out of school last year? It did something to her while they were alone. That's why she dropped out. If it did the same thing to Trevor, we need to find him now. Matt is noticeably shaking. He asks me what we should do. I say, I think we need someone to watch the basement door. I'm not going out there by myself, so we have to get someone else. Ask him if either of his parents are home. They both have far commutes. They've already left for work. Matt says he can't go back downstairs. I don't think I can either. I say, okay, one of us has to stay here and watch the door and make sure it doesn't come after us. And one of us has to go out into the dark woods alone. Matt looks like he's about to cry because he's a little bitch. Matt, God damn it, now is not the time. Man up, you son of a bitch. Think about Trevor, he says. Okay, okay, I'll stay here. Of course you will. Okay, you have to watch the door. If it comes out, try to stall it. If it gets past you, run and scream. Try to warn me. He nods vigorously. Okay. Man up and on. Try to get myself pumped up as best as I can. Realize I should probably have a weapon. Since we're already in the kitchen, I grab a knife out of the drawer. As I leave, I say to Matt, Do not take your eyes off the door. Do not fall asleep. That fucking door is your job now. He nods even harder. I step outside. It's still pretty dark. It's late fall too, so it's nice and fucking frosty. Start walking to the woods. It's down a hill. Reach the edge of the woods. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Fuck. Come on, Anon. Enter the woods. Realize I have no actual plan for finding Trevor. Start quietly calling his name as I wander around. Blindly dig around the woods while I try not to shit my pants from fear. Finally, hear something. Stop moving. Say, Trevor? Hear a wet wheeze. Start crawling around on the ground and saying, Trevor, where are you? Oh, Jesus, fuck no. Trevor is laying on the ground. There's blood all over his face and down his chest. Panicking, cussing incoherently. Try to drag him up. He can't stand. Grab his arms and hoist him on like a backpack. Run for the house as fast as I can. Which isn't very fast because I'm weak and Trevor is fat. Make it out of the woods. Christ, how am I going to get up the hill? It's too fucking steep. Trying to climb up the hill. Start screaming for Matt to come help me. Matt comes out. Runs down the hill. I scream at him to grab his fucking legs. I grab his arms. We start hauling Trevor's fat ass up the hill. Nearly at the top. It appears at the door. It was dark outside. Could have been a shadow. Could have been a trick of the eye. Its mouth was stretched open in such a way that it appeared not to have a jaw. And its tongue was hanging out like a tentacle. Not gonna lie. I shed a little. As I'm about to start screaming, I look at Matt, then back at it. It looks normal. It says, Holy shit, what the fuck happened? Don't know what to say. It says, I'm calling 911. 
ran back into the house to call 911. We get Trevor inside, open his mouth. No teeth ripped out. His tongue is still there. Rip his shirt open. There's no visible wound on him. The bleeding is coming from inside. No idea how to stop bleeding like that. Tell Matt to stay with him. The others are coming upstairs now because the screaming chaos has woken them up. Leave Matt and let him tell everyone what's happening. Go to find it. It's on the phone with 911. Watch it. It sees me looking. Stares back. It hangs up after the ambulance has been dispatched. We stare each other down for a moment. It tips its head. It says, It's horrible what happened to Trevor. It would be really horrible if it happened to someone else. I understand. It says, I'm sure Trevor will be fine though. But there's no telling how bad it would have been if it happened to you or anyone else. Yeah, I get it. It comes up to me with its head still tipped. It steps past me. It says, You didn't see anything. When the ambulance arrived, we told the paramedics we found him in the woods like that. They had to take him alone because it was obvious he was badly hurt, so they couldn't wait for his parents. In the hospital, they found that the inside of his esophagus, down to his stomach, and windpipe were torn up. His dad said that it looked like a cat climbed down his throat. They couldn't figure out what the fuck happened, and Trevor apparently didn't remember. They questioned him for a long time, but he swore up and down that he had no idea. Despite the fact that every doctor said that the wounds like that couldn't have come from swallowing something, he was put in therapy. He still claims he has no idea what happened. He can't talk anymore. Quite some time after Trevor was assaulted, still only Matt and I are suspicious of it. Even Trevor doesn't seem scared of it. It hasn't done anything else that we know of since then. I, once again, got lulled back into thinking I was just paranoid and that it was a normal, nice person. Our group is out eating at Steak and Shake. Kenny brought his girlfriend with him. She is extremely annoying. She ordered a sampler thing. She keeps making people try her food. Eventually, she starts squealing at it to try her slider. It says no thank you. She squeals harder. She squeals harder. She starts shoving the burger in its face. Kenny says, Jesus Christ, just eat the fucking burger. It opens its mouth to accept a burger. She jams it in. It bites. Doesn't seem to chew at all. Annoying little banshee sits back down, satisfied. She says, Isn't it so good? It opens its mouth to answer. Its mouth falls open further. Its eyes roll back. It falls face first into its plate. Little banshee screams. I shake it. Roll it out of the food. Out like a light. I look at little banshee and say, Holy shit, you killed it. She starts crying. Kenny tells me to shut up. It starts making a noise like my grandma when she gets shit-faced. It says, What did you do? Lil Banshee chants, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It grimaces, holds its head up and sits up. It says, What was on it? Lil Banshee says, Just crispy onions and ketchup and barbecue sauce, I think. I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. It says, I can't fucking eat ketchup, asshole. Hmm. It slowly recovers, and we continue with our night. Keep thinking about the ketchup thing. That was no allergic reaction. Not a human one, anyway. Despite not being on guard anymore, I did still wonder about him. Wonder about the ketchup thing for weeks. Finally talked to Matt about it. He's been wondering, too. He straight out asks, How would we get it to eat enough to knock it out long enough for us to look at it? I say, We would have to hide it in something. Maybe in something that tastes similar. We think about it. Matt says, but it would know that we drugged it when it woke back up. Shit, that is very true. He says, we could have one of our moms do it. Like, invite it over for dinner, and mom put a shitload of ketchup in the food. Dude, do you seriously want to sacrifice your mom to a green-haired throat rapist? Never mind. And so that idea pretty much got stopped cold. However, there was one day, at Kenny's house, after he'd been dumped. We were having a forget-that-bitch party. It starts acting weird, staggering around, holding its head, finally lays down on the couch. I ask it if it's okay. It says, Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. I say, Are you having a migraine? Maybe you should go downstairs. The dark would be easier on your eyes. It slurs a little. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good idea. Dark sounds good. It wobbles up and starts trying to walk. I say, Okay, you can't go downstairs by yourself. You're gonna fall. Let me help you. It thanks me. I walk it downstairs. When I come back up, my friends ask what we were doing. Tell them it had a migraine and need to lay down in the dark. 
They accept that. Except Matt. Matt looks at me. I nod toward the next room over. We mosey on over. I tell him it was having trouble walking and seeing, and possibly thinking, judging by how it was talking. He whispers, Do you think it's going to pass out? <clears throat> Obviously, I don't have any way to be sure, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't check on it in, say, half an hour. See how it's doing. He nods. Half an hour-ish later, we go downstairs. It's lying on the couch, face down. We were both nervous. At least I was. I finally say, It? No response. Say it a little louder. No response. Say it in almost a shout. No response. Approach it slowly. Quietly say, Hey, It. Are you okay? Nudge it on the arm. Keep gently talking to it like that while I prod at it. Completely non-responsive. Look back over at Matt. He's still composed. Tell him to come over. We roll it over. Its mouth is open. Jesus Christ, should I really? Slowly, slowly, slowly reach towards its mouth. Gently, delicately, push its jaw down. Keep pushing it down. Keep pushing it down. Its jaw opens so far its chin touches its neck. Its tongue sloughs out. It's long and thick. That's what she said. Start inspecting the tongue without touching it. Reluctant to touch it. Figure, I'm in this shit neck deep already anyway. Not touching the tongue isn't going to save me if it wakes up. Pick up the tongue. Start messing with the tongue to see what it does. It's really flexible. It can be flattened, pointed, and stretched. When it flattens and bends at the same time, it feels really rough. Stretch it out as far as I can without straining it. It's about as long as my forearm. Something pointy comes out of the tip when it's stretched that far. Touch the point. It draws blood. Son of a bitch. Put the tongue back from whence it came. Shut its mouth. Step back. Look at Matt. Matt looks sick. I'm not done. Look back at it. Lift up its stupid ugly sweater. The spandex suit it wears goes all the way up to its neck and on its arm. No idea how to get it off. Fuck it. Try to feel its chest. Looking for any sign of breast buds. Nothing at all. Stranger though. I can't feel nipples either. Pull its shirt back down now. Roll it back over how we found it. It came back upstairs several hours later. It looked really haggard and wouldn't talk much, but it didn't seem to know what we had done. Unfortunately, the story ends there. OP just goes on to discuss theories about the catch-up, while others mention that they could hunt him down, or they could fuck him for revenge. Kind of stuff that you would think you would see on 2014X. Kind of made me nostalgic, not gonna lie. Also, they posted pictures of it, and it was just some fat kid in a wig. So I'm not going to dox the kid. Bye, friends. Have a great night.